but the school would be, instead of the students going to school a mile from the, their house, the school would move and meet in East Otisfield for two months, and then it would meet in Pumpkinville, in, in the Gore for two months, and then it would meet Spurs Corner for two months. So students went, did not have to go to school, the school went to them. One school that moved. Uh, a different system. About 1800, about the time Otisfield was founded, the system changed to the district system. Uh, most of you kind of have a rough idea of what that was. That means one-room schoolhouses scattered all over town. Uh, the schoolhouses usually went with the centers of population. Um, in Otisfield, there were as many as 14 different districts at one time. Not all the schools were open at any one time. It depended on the demand and what students were there. Other thing is that the districts have changed uh, every 20 years or so, they would do a redistricting of the whole town. That would be more come, become more apparent to see the overheads. Um, but it's kind of um, an always changing system depending on the uh, population of the town and where the children were. Remember, Otisfield then, in 1840, had about as many people as it does now. This is hard for us to believe. Uh, 1840, it hit something like 1,300, population 1,300 people. That's a lot of people, and, and the families were very large. Uh, my uh, husband's grandmother uh, was one of nine. Uh, that was very common. The Picos were notorious for their large families. <laughs> 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 not your, not your, not you. <laughs> other other Pico families. Uh, uh, throughout town, 10, 12 children was, was pretty common. So there's a big demand on the school system. Uh, these, again, were one-room schools. Each district hired its own teacher and controlled its own teacher. The, mem the person from each district was a member of the town school committee. The town financed education as a whole. But and pay for the schoolhouses, but each district ran its own affairs. They hired the teacher, they set the term, uh, the length of the term, they figured out what they were going to do with the school books, they made the rules in that district. Usually there were two terms, summer term and a winter term. Summer term was taught by the woman. Winter term was usually taught by a man, but not always. The man always got twice the salary as the woman did same amount of work. Uh, how much the person got paid was not a con determined by contract, but usually by uh, sex, and how many students that person had. If you only had a few students, you wouldn't get as much money. Also by the length of the term. Terms were usually 10 to 12 weeks. I, try, I multiply that out. I said, well, that's 50, uh, that's 5 times 10 is 52. Uh, 60, 70 days. There are two terms a year. That's maybe 100 days a year of school compared to what is it now, 180? That's standard. Okay, so that's not a lot. Uh, then there were sometimes private schools. This is before before the present day. This is before the 20th century. I'm talking about 19th century. Right off, the parents would decide it was. They didn't have enough uh, kids were getting enough education, so they would. Um, hire the teacher for is a private school. Usually it's still back in, in the schoolhouse. The schoolhouses were used not just for education, but very often for religious services, for town meetings, for neighborhood meetings, for all kinds of communities, community gatherings. Um, the Wardwell School, for example, um, in the diary I've read about in our family, uh, they mentioned meeting, having religious meetings, Baptist meetings in the Wardwell School. I asked Howard Dyer, was this possible? Do you know anything about that? And he said, well, of course. He said, the Wardwells were very religious. <laughs> <laughs> so, the Wardwell School is on the Bean, corner of the Bean Road and the Callister Road at this point. Okay, um, and my husband's family has Wardwell so. All right, what else do I need to say? Uh, Okay, I, I talked about how the schools were financed and controlled. 
and uh, I also say that school books were usually not uh, very plentiful. Um, the graded readers did not come in until the last half of the 19th century. There were usually no blackboards until about 1850. Uh, think what think what a difference it made not to have a blackboard. The teacher is really is really tough to do group instruction if you don't have a blackboard. Uh, eventually, they developed uh, just plain wooden boards that were painted black that served as blackboards. Um, uh, the schools were very often the first schools were heated by fireplaces. Uh, most of you know that's not a very good way to the school. Uh, by 1840, stoves began to replace the fireplaces, but as late as 1857, the Scribner's Hill School was still heated by fireplace. 1857, according to Lydia Spur. Uh, okay, we've got other things. Uh, there was no compulsory education until 1850 in Maine. Uh, that meant there were an awful lot of kids that just um, fell through the cracks. Um, in 1850, the first uh, main compulsory education uh, law required that all, teach, all children between 8 and 15 attend school at least 16 weeks a year. That's 80, 80 days. Again, it's not much of a, not a very long education. And it was a footnote to that, that most children over 13 did not attend. They dropped out at 13. Okay, the, uh, another point is that teacher, the teachers that were teaching in these schools uh, were often young women, often 16, 17 years old without any training at all. There was no training. I'm talking again about the 19th century. Uh, the first teacher's college in Maine opened in Farmington in 1862, 64. 1893, things, got, things were not too good. In 1893, Maine finally abolished their district system. That doesn't mean that one of those schoolhouses are out. It simply means that the control is different. At that point, uh, the towns had to treat all their schools equally. The full control of the school went to the town. The town also was required for the first time to supply textbooks, which have been kind of uh, loose time. And at this point, the state of Maine also began the limited sharing of educational expenses. In other words, aid to schools began without paying. Okay, I'm, I'm going to start with the first overhead, which actually kind of summarizes <coughs> what, I, what I've been talking about. Um, uh, we have, you know, lots of nostalgia about the wonderful one-room wonder schools. Uh, there's no nonsense education, and I think that was probably true. I think discipline was a huge job for the teacher. I went to a two-room schoolhouse, and I remember that when, when I had finished my work, there was nothing to do. And, and you were expected to be quiet and, and find something to do. Uh, probably others have the same reaction. Strong emphasis <coughs> on, on the basics, reading, writing, and arithmetic, but there was nothing else. There's no geography, no history usually. Again, this is the 19th century. Neighborhood oversight and control, uh, that could be good and bad, as most of you know. Everyone knew everything that was going on in that school. My mother uh, taught in a one room schoolhouse in Massachusetts, and she got outraged. She had two Faye children in her class, and Mrs. Faye, every day, would bring her garden to school and sit there in the front of the classroom in darn socks. <laughs> Uh, flexible learning. Uh, students learn from other classes, the classes open them. I don't know. I, I, I never did, but I don't know if, any, any, if that was true. Uh, Gordon is nodding his head. Yes. He thinks that if, was true. If you're in a one-room schoolhouse, yeah. you know, and say you're in the fourth grade, you're there while the teacher is working with the eighth graders. And you could listen. Yeah, and you're learning it for four years ahead of time. You couldn't help with that's right. <laughs> not much privacy. Okay. I put down what was what was not so good about them and uh, uh, I'm just summarizing quickly a high teacher turnover rate. Those young women were not allowed to continue teaching once they were married. 
And most of them, it's such a stressful job, difficult job, that most of them didn't last more than a year or two anyway. Uh, I started to say, um, Mary, Mary Friday night, I've talked about a lot. Uh, who lived on Bell Hill and died in 1892. She taught in several schools in Otisville, including the Gore. Uh, when she was 25, she herself was still going to school. You kind of went, you, there were no strict rules about age. She had been a teacher, but she was going to school at the same time. It's very odd. And sometimes I'm sure the 16-year-old teachers had children in their class that were older than they were. Okay, fully prepared teachers, I've already talked about, they had no way of getting any uh, training other than uh, what they've been through themselves. Sometimes there were institutes for teachers, uh, which gradually led to the teacher's college. No standard textbooks until after 1893. So every student would bring their own book. <laughs> That's pretty tough. Uh, discipline problems, obviously. Truancy problems. Uh, Howard mentions uh, the Truman officer in Otis Field. Uh, he said he never had any trouble with him, but his brother did. His brother Ben usually got hauled off by the Truman officer just about every day. <laughs> uh, environmental problems, I think, uh, we don't quite appreciate. Uh, Gordon, you went to Bell Hill. Were there any problems up there with heat, air, light? No, if you were sitting close enough to the Stole. <laughs> <laughs> I think in a lot of those schools, uh, there, was, there were problems with, um, with air, heat, and light, depending on where they were situated and... Kerosene lights. Did you have kerosene lamps? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. In the dark winter months. But you're up on the top of the hill, too, right? yes. where the breeze blows. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I, I remember the snow coming in through a crack in the back of the wall, back wall of the building. Uh, I also read somewhere about, um, I think it was from uh, Stell Stone's notes, uh, that during one season school was just not helped. How, how long was one season? Several weeks? Mm -hmm. uh, five weeks. Five weeks, yeah. Church wasn't held either right now. So everything was just kind of calm. It's hard for us to recall that. Okay, we're going to switch at this point. That's kind of all by way of background. Uh, I want to talk about uh, most of this emphasis is on um, how the different schools were located in Otisville. Every town had in Maine, as far as I know, had this district system. Um, this is um you got you got an Otisville map, first Otisville. Just just an old, old uh, not that one, this, 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 um, that, that's, yeah, that's one. Yeah, that's one. Uh, David did all these maps before he went, and uh, spent a lot of time on them. Uh, this basically is the base map of Otisville with the rows in there. It's a little hard to, uh, you see them use your imagination. Uh, if I go too fast, stop. <coughs> but obviously this is Thompson Pond, Pleasant Pond. So you can orient yourself that way. This is the basic roads of Otis. Now you can put on that, that first one. Okay, this is the way the districts were laid out. The green lines are the boundaries of the district. This is 1837, is that the right? Yeah. And I want to read a little bit. <coughs> about, uh, Dave went to some trouble to uh, find these boundaries. I'll, I'll just read boundaries for District 1, which is right there, which is first corner. This is according to the town reps. District number 1, beginning at the south corner of Achilleus Dale's Land, Lot 46, then the southwesterly course between Lots 44 and 43, and 37 and 38, and 34 and 33, and 27 and 28, and 24 and 23, and 17 and 18. <laughs> That's north 45 degrees east, between lots 14 and 17, then south 25 degrees east, between lots 14 and 15, then north 45, I won't go walk, it just goes up. We've got page after page of this stuff. Uh, and he's able to figure it out, kind of. Uh, that's 
bit conjectural, but uh, it kind of indicates um, where the center of the population were in town at that time. It pretty, spread pretty well through town. Um, East Falls, number 12, is actually by this time in Naples. So that doesn't really enter in. I must have a little, I must have a little pen with a, with a line on it. Lost that. Number 7 got left out by the stack. There you go, Jean. Yeah. Okay, number seven. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, you got, you got the little line. Okay. Number seven, um, also made it by mistake. What they tended to do, what they tended to do uh, also is divide these things. Uh, split them in two when the population changed. Um, Poplar Ridge, 11, down there was, uh, was a school there. There was a school in most of these places. Um, got lots of pictures here, but all of, we have the pictures on the walls and we have pictures uh, that are coming up. And what it comes down to is that the school, all our pictures are divided into five categories. There are some districts with no school buildings that we have any, we have any information on. Other words, number 12. We have no information on the school in that district because it falls in East Falls. In east falls. Um, that's the main one. We don't know. And there's one up here in the very top of the. There. I can't even read the number. What's that number? Five. Oh, yeah. Five. Okay. That's. That's Bryfield, and, and we, uh, that's the Bryfield Bridge area, and we don't know anything about a school out there. There may or may not have been a school. We're still looking for that information. Okay, um, so as I said, they start they started juggling things around. Anthony, you want to put on the next two? In 1871, this information comes from this pink map over here. Um, the pink numbers are... <coughs> the districts in 1871. They are pretty much the same. Their 11 is, okay, sorry. Okay. Okay, Spurs Corner is still one. Now, now we have Tamworth uh, right there. Everyone know where the Tamworth Road is? Yeah, okay, you, you do. Okay, it's Tamworth Road. How do I say it, Alice? It's between, it's between the... Okay, oh, it's got those nails. Okay, okay. And there was a school there. Aunt Stell Stone said there was a school there that she remembered, but it's long gone. So there's another category of, of schools which we know existed, we don't have any information on. Um, so number seven has suddenly appeared again, right there. I think they discovered they had admitted it and they stuck it in. Um, East Falls is still 12, there's still no school there. Uh, in, that, in that map, there's unfortunately two number twos, which was very confusing. So that's why the question mark on Tamworth and Scribner Hill, because they're both two, unless one is 12. <laughs> or unless one is three. There is no three. So the map is a little difficult. A little difficult to deal with. Okay. Uh, Poplar Ridge is the other one that people don't know much about. Uh, that's where the community of the resurrection is now. A lot of you know where that is. It's, it's off the road to Casper. Uh, from State Route 121. Okay. Um, that's, a, that's about it on the, on the uh, overhead protection. And we're going to switch. Uh, I will say that the uh, 1893 may abolish the district system, but left is most of its one group of school builders in place. After World War II, changes in transportation led to school consolidation. I think you're all aware of that. Uh, all of a sudden, it was possible to um, to close some of those one-room schoolhouses which were expensive to maintain and difficult for the students. Uh, the main consolidation was into this building. 
uh, Apple's going to uh, show us, I guess, I guess we have the lights on. They're right above me. <laughs> okay. Apple's going to show us uh, consolidation number one was uh, this building. Um, consists of, the first part of this building consists of the old East Otisfield School. There's a picture of that up uh, somewhere here. Um, and Callie says that the, that old East Otisfield School became the left wing of this building. Of the town office. Of the town office, of this building. No. Is that right? Some people think we are in the original yes. school yes. building right now. Yes. Okay. Well, obviously, we can vote on that. No, that's probably right. And next slide, uh, Kathy. Yeah. Uh, this is Kathy Hall. She's the director. Yeah. And uh, next slide, uh, Kathy. Okay, this is just another shot. And then the next one will be is better. It shows us more. Okay, this is the back. This is the back. And, and we all agree that this is the Spur old Spurs Corner School? Yes. 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 Okay. And that was moved over from Spurs Corner in 1949. And Howard Dyer remembers it very carefully. I wish he were here tonight. Yes. Uh, because they tried to get the school over Nutting Hill and couldn't get up the hill. Mm -hmm. So they called Howard, who was then living on Scrippner Hill, and he got his tractor and came to the rescue and brought the, the school the rest of the way. Uh, and some, I think Apple has a picture of the truck moving the school in 1949. And Dorothy remembers this too because she wanted to, wasn't it even the one to watch? You wanted to, and you were sick that day, so you could I had a gallbladder cat that day, and I was very sick, but I had to see that school <laughs> <laughs> so I went to watch that being done, and I went to the hospital afterwards. <laughs> so what these pictures are, the, all these slides are, are all the all the school buildings that exist in one form or another in Otisfield, except for the latest one. I forgot to take a picture of, of, of the Otisfield <laughs> Community School. Okay, we see the next one. Uh, everyone know what this one is? Uh, this is the Gore, the, sc uh, the schoolhouse in the Gore. It is the second school in the Gore. The first one was brick. I think we've got pictures of the brick schoolhouse. We do not have a picture of uh, this schoolhouse when it was used as a schoolhouse. This now belongs to Lester Thomas's daughter, Crystal McKay, and her husband. It is now a residence. It's in, I think it's in its original location. Uh, it was built sometime after 1927. The original brick schoolhouse in the Gore uh, was built 1839. I think by 1920, 1920s it was simply uh, too dilapidated. It was built the same time that the Bell Hill Schoolhouse, the Bell Hill School, and also the Spurs Corner School were built. They were all brick. Okay, next. I remember that area being called number four, but. But on your map, you have it as number six. Okay. Is that? I don't know. <laughs> I not it seems to me my parents just called that area where the Grange is and where the school was. Yeah. They just called it number four. Okay. <laughs> uh, this is uh, the east of the school, or Pugmanville School. We have the current occupant owner here tonight. Um, this was built in the, I don't know when it was built. It must have been built fairly early. It was always uh, at that location, as far as I know. Would, would you like to add anything to that, Laura? Um, oh, there you I think you know more about it than I do, certainly. Uh -huh. There's some strange things that we found inside that we wondered about. Uh, I don't know if there's anyone who saw one of the schoolhouse here tonight. I asked this open question. No, I, guess I went to H.G. So, so you would remember what it looked like inside? Oh, yes. Well, right in, in this room here, uh, we took down the um, acoustic tiles and there was uh, kind of board and, and bead ceiling. But in one section right above these windows, but cut in a particular way, there was none of that wood and there was just a leg. But, but the wood was actually cut so that it was a deliberate thing. It wasn't that I, I think the ceiling fell down at that point and just didn't get replaced. 
So, I, we, so we've debated, it's right, right in front of these windows, right on the other side where these windows are. And my husband thinks maybe there's a cloakroom here, but I say, no, it's crazy talk, because, you know, why would you have a cloakroom right with windows in it? Do you, do you, can you shed any light on uh, why that would be like that? There's also there was a window there, then, and it, there was a cloakroom at one time, but there also were chemical toilets. Because there's an outhouse in the back. Yeah. The there was some doors there. Right up here front. Yeah. Oh, okay. Because it looks like in a couple of those pictures that, the, that you can see these windows. Uh, there's people standing like by the door, and there's windows right behind them. It looks like this door. And it looks like these windows. But I guess not. I, I well, I don't remember about the windows. But there was a cloakroom right here. Yeah. All right. Well, my husband is right after all. <laughs> <laughs> Why would a one-room schoolhouse have a second floor? What was up there? Sorry, you asked a question. Yes. Why would a one-room schoolhouse have a second floor? I don't, that one I don't know. I've wondered about that. And where so the I have to put bedrooms in my closet. Maybe you've been a picture of the roof. Put me for a picture of the night off. They have a. They, they have an even more steeply pitched but generally the teacher did not live there. No, oh no, no, no. Teacher always boarded around the community. No. Teacher, uh, Mary Friday Knight, for example, lived, lived on Bell Hill, but she always boarded in, in, in the Gore, in the brick house in the Gore. She stayed there uh, during the week. She would walk home uh, on weekends. A teacher always boarded around. There would not have been a second floor. What while the school would be used as a school, would there have been? No. 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 Simply would have been just open, open attic space. Open or was it, was it a ceiling? It was, it was a ceiling. ceiling. Yeah. Okay. Maybe they used it for storage. Okay. Um, Do you stairs? Do you remember stairs going up? No, there was no one. It would just see a lot. Is Hazel Ward here tonight? Uh, this is Hazel Ward's house in Costas Mills. Um, it is actually the Swampville School. Uh, anyone know where the Swampville Road is? Yeah, a couple of you do. Okay, Swampville Road is a semi, I could say semi discontinued road because you can drive. Oh, it's a good road now. <laughs> it's all the it goes between uh, Bell Hill Road and Costas Mills Road. And the schoolhouse was located on the Swampville Road, but quite close to the Bostas Mills Road. Um, Hazel Ward's parents um, uh, bought it in 1941, I believe, from the town and moved it uh, to its present location, which is at the beginning of Bostas Mills Village. Uh, you can sort of see that they've added a, this is probably the original group right here, and the second story has been added. I think the next slide shows that maybe. Better, yeah. Uh, you can sort of see the roof, the original roof line right there. And she said it still has the original wainscoting and uh, wooden floors that were in it when she was the schoolhouse. Her father went there. She did not go there. She went as a child to the well, school. Well, it's just about the top there. Okay. I think my father died there. Oh, you think so? Yeah. Well, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. Okay. 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 Well, you walked from East Otisfield. You walked. I think so. That's a long walk. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, this is the Rayville Schoolhouse, uh, which no. stood on the corner of the... No. It's <laughs> not the Rayville Schoolhouse? That, that's the Rayville Schoolhouse. Okay, okay, sorry. What is it? It's not the Rayville Yes, it is. is. Okay. Okay, I don't mind a little discussion. <laughs> um, um, I, yeah, I thought it was a radical schoolhouse. Yeah. Um, it, it was stood originally on the, a corner of the Jackson Brook Road. It's amazing how many of these have been moved. Um, I suppose they were moved before the power lines were uh, everywhere. Uh, corner of the Jackson Brook Road, which is uh, about a mile down the Randall Road, uh, beyond the. Uh, between the brick house and the uh, the mill the mill house there, um, and I don't know when it was moved. I can tell you. Um, someone knows when it was moved. Nineteen fifty. Okay, great. And 
Gordon, you said it was last, you said it was used when? 19... It's still being used in 1942. Okay. Yes. Because I, I was a student there in 1942. This is another view of it. Um, you see that the roof has been changed and the things have been added on. Uh, for example. Uh, the house is for sale right now. Mm -hmm. so, okay. And this one is the Poplar Ridge Schoolhouse. Uh, do we have Mr. Johnson here today? No. Um, it's the Poplar Ridge Schoolhouse that was moved. Um, Howard said after 1910, he didn't seem very sure of his day when it was moved. Um, um, someone said the Poplar Schoolhouse did not have very many students and it may have been discontinued early. It originally stood uh, on the opposite side of the road from the community of the resurrection, somewhere, according to Howard again, who remembers everything, almost everything. <laughs> I think we have another slide of that, or do we? Yeah, again, you can see the roof line, the original roof line there. I'm sure the door, that's a pretty new door, it's been changed. The windows may look like the original the, windows then. There was no dome on it. Yeah. Uh -huh. It was just a, you know, building where the, and then there was no upstairs. And what it uses as a general store for a Yes. Do you change Scribner? Yes. And it's right across the street from you. It's right opposite you right now. Yeah, and then it became an ice cream parlor. Okay. So a couple of girls started an ice cream parlor. When was that? Oh, it was in the twenties sometime. They they had it in in I think a couple of summers. Other people remember the ice cream parlor? Well, it's right opposite your house, so. Well, you I didn't, didn't live there then. I didn't live there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Stella Edwards, who taught in Spurs Connor, lived in that house. Okay. Right there. Okay. What else we got? Uh, we've got the, um, the Bell Hill Schoolhouse, um, which was built 1839, the same year that the church, the Bell Hill Meeting House, was built. Um, and is the only only um, schoolhouse, one room schoolhouse in Otisville, still in its original, still existing as a schoolhouse, as far as I can tell. Uh, Gordon went there. Anyone else? Dar no, Dorothy, you didn't go there, did you? Yes, I did. Okay. <laughs> My picture's over there on the wall. <laughs> okay. Anyone else go, go to that school? I would do okay. Yes. Um, my whole family, my, my mother and my aunts all went there, and, and my own family went there, and... <laughs> um, and you walked. You had a long walk. Of course, that's the only way you could get here. Yeah. It's a long walk up that hill. Did you slide down the hill? Yeah. In the winter? We used to slide a lot. <laughs> um, there used to be a woodshed, right? Here, yeah. uh, and I don't know. And the, we have pictures of the, a lot of old pictures of the sh of the of the school without the woodshed, and then we have some with the woodshed. And they took the woodshed off. I don't know when they took it off. Maybe when the Bell Hill Meeting House Association acquired it. Was it that recently? Yeah. I think it was before that. Before that. And when they did that, they had to repair the bricks here. But unfortunately, whoever did the brickwork used the wrong kind of water. I, I've forgotten what the technical problem is. It has something to do with the way it expands. Uh, and it became evident recently that those bricks were kind of in bad shape. So the Bell Hill Meeting House Association, which now owns it, uh, has hired Duncan Trail, many of you know, who was a very gifted mason to fix, this is the back corner he's working on, it's a little hard to see, uh, work to replace and repoint a lot of those bricks in the back end of it. And Dave and I were up there this afternoon, and they've just, uh, how it, uh, they were there with their, Frank Lockout was there, and some other people I didn't know with their uh, machinery and clearing out all the uh, grading, grading around the building. 
he has a better picture. In fact, you can see that wall there is just kind of hanging. Um, so he's, he's uh, going all around the building, replacing that grout. Uh, it should last another 100 years or so. Okay, uh, this is the Wardwell School. And this is the, the, probably the, the school in its most, in Oldsfield, in its most unrestored condition. I mean, which is the actual tree that you're doing. Where's that tree? Did anyone ever, did anyone here go to that school? I don't think it's been Someone asked there. where the school is located. What's that? Where, where is it? it? Where, oh, where it is. It is now on, it has been moved. It is now on the corner of the Bean Road and the McAllister Road. It has been used as a shed or a shack. It has been moved, I believe, didn't you tell us, Alice, from the corner of the Benny Road? No, it was just opposite from where it is, across oh. the road. But William Greenlee bought it as a can and moved it across the road. Okay, oh, just across the road. <coughs> and what did he use it for camp or? Yeah. yeah. It's uh, it's in um, pretty bad stuff uh, repair. Okay. I don't, yeah. Not very big either to use for, to use that, as I said, for church meetings at one time. Okay, is that the last slide, I think? Yeah, one. There's also a lot of graffiti on, graffiti on. I think we can turn the lights on. A lot of graffiti on the building. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Are there, are there no pictures of this first corner? There are no pictures of the, but that's not true. There are some pictures over here in these albums on the table of the wooden spurs corner school. There are some of the brick, one of these, uh, I'm not quite sure where. Okay. I saw There's at least one of the brick spurs corners, uh, and as I understand it, the Dorothy told me that the brick, First corner school in the 1920s was transformed into the first Otisfield fire station. Otisfield does not like to waste its buildings. Jean yeah. McAllister would like to have as many of those children identified in that one photograph that she sent of just the children outside the school in Duncan Town. Okay. 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 Thank you. Good. Okay, we're going to switch gears. Uh, unless there are more questions on the school, I've got, I've got a hand, I guess most of you have the hand up. There's a lot of information on those. I don't want to go into every detail. But I've got, do you want to turn over the side of the Do you want to come sit up front? I'll swap. Jean, how many grades were covered in each of these one room schools? How many grades in each a good, a good. I think originally 12. Yeah. In, those, in those first schools, Mary Friday Knight was 26 when she was going to school. I, but I don't think they all was divided into grades. I think it was more kind of a loose arrangement of classes. I don't think that they did it quite as quickly as we do now. That was addressed uh, at the um on the tape in the first meeting we had on the history of the Ellisville schools, and so I'll mention that again later. Anybody want to get up and move around? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> it's all no more than my seat can endure. Okay, I have, uh, I have two options here. I can read you all four pages, or I can read you all the parts that mention people. Raise your hand if you want to hear all four pages. <laughs> Never mind. Um, I'll copy them off for you if you want um, at your tax paying expense. <laughs> so this says School Days in Otisfield Gore by Helen Brett Holt, written in 1984. Can you hear me? Can you guys hear me? I do have a good teacher voice. However, if I start going down, Raise your hand and let me know. When I sat at school in 1917, I attended a brick, one-room schoolhouse. My teacher was Lena Buck, a second cousin to my mother. She wore a long skirt and a blouse or a dress. My impression is that it was blue. On the side here, I'll bet you have one dress. <laughs> 
early in the fall she became quite impatient with me because I failed to remember something and she made me stay in at recess. I couldn't stand the disgrace and ask permission to go to the toilet. It was granted. At least two girls followed me into the outhouse, as sympathetic as could be. I asked one to get my coat and I went home, surprising my mother. I do not recall being scolded at all. Classes began at 9 a.m. and closed at 4 p.m. They had 15-minute recesses both morning and afternoon and an hour for lunch. When I first started teaching in SAD 17, we had 20 minutes for lunch, us teachers. I'm thinking, boy, an hour. <laughs> in the morning before entering the schoolhouse, we lined up outdoors to be quiet and marched into the schoolroom to our seats by a Victrola playing a match. We always had opening exercises, which included singing America, saying the Lord's Prayer, and saluting the flag. So I'm leaving out three paragraphs here. In my class were Ralph Thomas and Helena Honan. In the next class were Roland Annis, Elisa Honan, Lester Thomas, Oral Linnell, and my oldest sister, Willa Bratt. Another class had my oldest sister, Marion Bratt, and Doris Annis. Carla Honan was in another class. A. Leah Honan and William Whitman made another class. We probably never had more than 18 pupils in the school and no fewer than 12. Skip another two paragraphs, which include the fight. <laughs> My second year would be second grade at this time and there was no kindergarten. My brother Lawrence started school that fall. In his class were Rita Linnell and Marion Thomas. Our teacher was Miss Cummings. She did not complete the year. <laughs> Listening to June, I know why. When a teacher was done with one class, they would work quietly by themselves and listen to the older classes while the teacher worked with them. In nice weather in the fall, the first graders were allowed outdoors to play quietly after their lessons. When mother found out that Lauren was lying on the ground resting during that period, she was upset that the dampness might bring on rheumatic fever. Everyone brought their lunch to school. Most had homemade bread sandwiches. Some had biscuits, but the Linnell family had store-brought bread. And Mrs. Linnell was from the city and did not break her, bake her own bread. I considered store-bought bread desirable. When Lena Buck taught school, she boarded with her sister, and now I have to say it's either Lucia or Lucia. Lucia in Italian. Anybody know this name uh, as Lucia? Okay. Lucia? Could Lucia. be Lucia, yeah. Okay, Lucia York, who lived about a mile from the school. Lucia was a very good cook and made delicious looking lunches for Miss Buck. One thing that stands out in my memory is applesauce with heavy cream on it. <laughs> in warm weather, we would eat our lunches outdoors. Two or three would group together and eat and chat. It seems to me that we have lots of freedom and few restrictions. Perhaps that was because our teacher trusted us and knew our parents well. I'm skipping about five here. From grades five through eight, I had the same teacher, Bessie Durrell, who lived with her parents about a mile away in that and another direction. Miss Durrell knew us all so well, and our parents, that she was all that there was almost never a disciplinary problem. Miss Durrell was very fair. When she was upset, the color would start to rise from her neck into her face, and her eyes would glisten almost with tears. One such occasion occurred during a beautiful sliding weather. I was in the sixth grade, sixth, seventh or eighth grade by that time. We ate our lunches at our desks as usual, then hurried to don our wraps and be on our way. We chose the road called Bonnie Hill, down by the Grange Hall. The runners of heavy sleds for hauling logs had made the snow very smooth, a perfect place for one sled run. We had such a nice slide that we decided to go on down to the next hill to the bridge. <laughs> no one of us ever gave it so much as a thought that we would be late. It was 20 minutes past one when we returned to face an irate teacher, upset teacher. Mr. Durrell told us that we would miss our lunch hour for a week. No hard feelings seemed to be held, as I suppose we felt that we deserved it. We had spelling matches to see who could remain standing the longest. 
We also had arithmetic contests in addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. The Thomas family often won these as they were very quick with figures. <coughs> Even if some of the neighbors did not have children, they always seemed interested in what we were doing. Everett and Lucia York, Ralph and Merle Merrill, both had good-sized farms but no children. Sometimes I think Mother contrived for us to go see them, especially an elderly couple by the name of Nat and Florence Green. Florence Green's father had broken his hip and spent the rest of his days in bed, as hips did not heal easily. So we would stop occasionally. Could it be that we brought a little sunshine to them? We were always offered a drink of water. What could be more refreshing and satisfying? Mrs. Green was apt to pass us a sugar cookie as well. Her last paragraph which I love. It seems to me that I remember the social aspect of learning, to get along with others more than the daily grind of absorbing facts. Although the contests in math and spelling were remembered with fun, where about every grade was present, the older classes set the example for the young and were helpful and protective of <coughs> the school grounds. Maybe we learned a respectful attitude from the older children, too. I teach nowadays. <laughs> it is. She really writes beautifully. It's, didn't I say it? I did say it, didn't I? Yes. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Helen Brett Holt. Yeah, they could make copies of any of this stuff. She writes well. I don't know. I would assume she's one of the Brett She is one of the Brett Holtz. Yeah. You know what it says here? Maybe I should read just this as well. Several years of. Uh, she started in the Brick Schoolhouse, and she says in May 1922, Otis Field Selectman voted $2,500 to build a new school. So I don't know. This says 22. You said 27. I showed the picture. Yeah. Thomas is there. Yeah. So that's the one. That's the one. Not very big school. Thank you, Vicki. You're welcome. Good luck.
in the winter. Then walk home. So these one room school teachers uh, worked hard. Uh, some of the questions um, and the statements uh, from the audience um, from the meeting were, were interesting. Uh, they included um, were the following comments. Um, Most schools were in walk walking distance of the homes. Why were they always put on the top of the hills? <laughs> the school, the one room schoolhouse on the top of the top of the ridge road, was right on the corner. You know, it's a sharp corner, um, just before you get up to the farm, and that's where the schoolhouse was located. And of course, that's the one that was moved uh, moved uh, across from Dorothy Lombard's house in first floor. Betty Goss has a picture of her mom and the children she taught on Bell Hill. I'm not sure if, if that's one of the pictures we have here tonight or not. Um, Estelle's mother taught in the building across from the Ralph Lamb place. That would be the Pugliville School. Uh, on the back side of Scripture Hill is an old foundation. Is that a former school? And nobody was able to answer that question. What was the last year school was held, held at Bell Hill? And that was another question that nobody uh, was able to answer at that, uh, that meeting, which, by the way, uh, was in, uh, this was in 1981. In 41 or 42. 41 or 42. Uh, during month season, there was no school for five weeks, but school was not called off for snow. One day, Estelle started for, for the school on the door and got stuck halfway there but she walked the rest of the way. Unfortunately, no students came to school that day. <laughs> and she froze her legs. She <laughs> froze her legs. Um, Alice um, told a story about buying a mop of tea for $9? $9. $9. And on the way to school, gas line froze up. No problem, she took it off. Started a fire along the side of the road, got it out, and proceeded on its way to school. It was only a little bit late. Does anyone remember Mrs. Longmire? Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> many, many responded, I could hear in the audience on the tape, oh, yes, who uh, was the response to that question. Mrs. Longmire apparently was a very large woman. That was the Del Snee Longmire. Adele C. Longmire. Was she related to your husband? No. No? Okay. Anyway, she was six feet tall. Yeah, but she had very small legs. And <laughs> according to the person in the audience who was speaking, uh, they called her bird legs, but not to her face. <laughs> and the further comment was made that the children all had their halos on when Mrs. Longmire was present. <laughs> the mill pond would freeze over. This would be right across from the Thunderville School, or, or just almost right across. And Lillian fell through the ice. We got her out, though. I'm sure, was that Lillian B? That's yeah. right. <laughs> Ask him who was with her. <laughs> Don't think. Alice could probably laugh at that story. Eva <laughs> Bean was the teacher at the time. Uh, we all had chores to do at noontime. Uh, I, and this is Alice Stone speaking, I had to sweep and I had this dust pan just full and when no one was looking I tossed it out the window. <laughs> Unfortunately, Frank Bean happened to be walking by around that time. <laughs> and Frank was bigger than I was. <laughs> Boy, did I ever run up that hill. <laughs> I kept going. <laughs> I didn't come back until after the class had started again. <laughs> the children would play on the piles of logs in the mill yard and would run on the logs floating on the mill pond. So I guess there wasn't too much supervision during the lunch hour. <laughs> during the 1950s, the classrooms still had combined grades. Students would be moved ahead into the next grade if they were the only one uh, in one grade. 
So if somebody was the only child in the first grade and there were several in the second grade, then the child would be put in the group that were in the second grade. So some students got through school rather quickly that way. Um, and so they would finish um, according to um, the speaker uh, at this meeting. Some of the students would finish and get their diploma at age 15 and be too young to go out to work. So I think that sort of addresses the question of you know, how, how far along the grades went in these one year school classes. And I think that it's, at a certain point, they, they did go through to grade 12. And uh, as it indicated, that they uh, received their diploma. Uh, for discipline, the parents were more involved. Uh, children would be punished at school, but then they'd, they'd get home and they'd also be punished for their transgression at home. <laughs> you can verify that. Yeah. And, uh, there was a, a funny fun comment made uh, at the end of the tape uh, about the children having to work a lot at, because it was a farming community and so they worked on the farms and then they had chores to do at school. And so uh, the comment was, look at the pictures. No fat children, you're always working. <laughs> For all we hear today about fat children, I thought that was, uh, this was 20 years ago, uh, that, that comment was made. So uh, now um, I'd like to invite you to um, share any stories or anecdotes, uh, whether you went to a one, one room schoolhouse or not in Oakesville, uh, but we'd love to hear them, don't we? When you spoke about restoring the deck out the window, it made me think of a story that my husband had always told me. Over at Spurs Corner, they had a Christmas program in the school and after it was over, they were cleaning up, and a kid came and threw the Christmas tree out the door. My husband was walking by the school when it struck him in the nose and broke his nose. <laughs> so he always, his nose was always a little crooked. He said, that's why. <laughs> Well, if anyone can talk about Mrs. Longbar, I heard I haven't been known Mrs. Longbar, but I saw some, I heard some, some groans and moans with her name. I heard from that direction. <laughs> I was the only student in my grade in the Bell Hill schoolhouse, a subprimary first. Second, and I don't know, maybe third. Okay, I was there when they closed the school, and then I went to the Rayville School for either one or two years. Then the fifth grade, I wound up in this building, and then for grades six, seven, and eight, over to Spurs Corner, which is in that process of consolidation. Okay. Uh, but anyway, I can remember Mrs. Lombard. I must have been in the first grade. Might have been subprimary, but I probably first grade. And I had learned to count from one to 100. And the teacher had me stand up and count for this huge, towering female, okay? She wore a, a felt, it looked like a felt, felt coat with a fur wrap around it, you know? This, I don't know what it was, you know, might have been a fox for all I know. But she was a very imposing looking woman. So I sat out and I counted just as fast as I could. One or two classes, and then eight, 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 all the way up to, you know. Uh, and I get up 79, 80, 81, 82, 83, 84, 85, 86, 87, 88, 90, 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, 
97, 98, 99, 100. Anxiety crazy. Sigh of relief because I've got me. And she looked at me and said, young man, that is 100. And I just collapsed. Because <laughs> I simply said, 100. And I can remember to this day, it flashing through my mind. 100. There's more. <laughs> but very, very true that uh, she was a very imposing woman. She used to inspect your fingernails to see if they were in proper shape. Yes. Was she, 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 she was the superintendent. Oh, okay. You only had to see her once to remember her the rest of your life. <laughs> she, she would come around once or twice a year. Not very often, as I recall. Not as often as the traveling music teacher. She'd come every week. Was she superintendent a long time? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I can't remember what, what town she had. Okay? I think, but I, I think it was Casco. Casco way. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Wasn't it? Yeah. That, that's my guess. Yeah. Okay? Because I can remember uh, a... Uh, a children's field day, for example, where we went as a school down Raymond or Gorham Way, mm -hmm. something like that. And I, I, I think we were linked up educationally in that direction rather than Oxford, Norway, Paris way. Yes, Cumberland County, you see. So we would have gone that way. Good point. Yes. morning and there was a front 
entrance closet where she had uh, a uh, kerosene stove, hot plate type of thing, where she would cook our lunch, which is primarily soup. <laughs> I remember beans. I can remember the hot lunch on Belle Hill in the winter time was oatmeal with raisins and apples in it. That's what Mrs. Homer told me this summer. Yeah. She said that was very popular. Uh, she got uh, government commodities, uh, a long oatmeal, and they, they brought up the bushel of apples. She said that's what she cooked a lot. But she was a teacher at that time, and she was cooking hot lunch. Yes. She said, I remember. Yeah, she'd do it, you know, just as she was talking with the kids. She said, I remember standing by the stove cooking and teaching yeah. the class. <laughs> being, being the only one in my class, being the youngest kid in the whole school, probably I had certain privileges that other people didn't have. And uh, I can remember when I got there, the first thing in the morning, this was in the winter, I'd go around and collect all of the frozen ink wells, take them out of the individual desk, slide them close to the stove. The stove was in the back of the room and, and had a metal around it so we wouldn't burn ourselves and so forth. And I could slide the frozen inkwells underneath the tin protection area. And then while school was in session, I had the privilege of being able to get up out of my seat and retrieve those inkwells, which are now thawed out, and taking them around and putting them back in the student's desk. And I didn't have to ask permission. He said, this was my chore, my job, something like that. And a great deal of my time uh, was spent outdoors. It wasn't in the classroom, really. She had, uh, I'd spend a few minutes in the morning, and then she'd let me go outdoors. <laughs> and I was outdoors until after recess. <laughs> and I was outdoors probably most of the afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess. <laughs> I'm not sure sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> what Callie described doesn't sound to me like a hot lunch. All you have to do is boil water. You well, have to bring your own soup, right? Yeah. I'm pretty sure it was set right. We brought an old jar of soup from home. You know, I, and they put it in the pan. And, you know, and then by lunchtime, we had, you know. So nobody had to cook anything. Yeah. Not, I don't remember them cooking anything for us here in this class. In this <coughs> when we came back, we had the cafeteria, whole hot lunch. Way back before that, before organized hot lunches, my mother, <coughs> on Monday, maybe, would make a huge great kettle of corn chowder, uh, tomato soup or something, and another day later on, uh, <coughs> somebody else would do the same thing. But it wasn't organized, uh, nobody did any cooking. We all had little dishes and a spoon, and we all took to whoever brought one of them. That's what my mother used to take the soup.
part I funded. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, what about discipline in these one room schoolhouses? Were the teachers pretty strict? Did you ever get uh, get on the hand with a ruler or that kind of thing? Well, they always had a rule on the side. Yeah. It was a side for Alice? I was a good girl. I think. <laughs> I, I don't remember being disciplined. No, I don't. Well, as someone mentioned in those days, the parents, I remember my parents telling me, if you get in trouble at school, you're going to be in trouble when you get home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, the way things happened back in those days, the teacher would be down in the state's prison. Uh, I didn't see it. I was going to school in Beginning Falls. The undertaker's son was kind of a, <laughs> you know, energetic fellow, to put it mildly. <laughs> and uh, he was doing something one day, and Mrs. Tabox, who was the teacher, walked up beside him and cut him beside the head. <laughs> <laughs> and in fashion, so she got a little ways away, he said, <laughs> Well, apparently she did. She walked down to the desk, and he was a geography like that, and she walked up the aisle very slowly when she got beside the desk. You walked and hit him inside the head and knocked him right into the aisle. <laughs> so she said, There, Mr. Taka, did that hurt you or anything? <laughs> Well, you can imagine what would happen today. <laughs> I have an impression that uh, I was probably in the third grade in a radio school that maybe the teacher that year did not have good discipline. Okay. Uh, it's just something in the back of my mind. I can recall some big boys, okay, in the school that year that really uh, estimated the teacher. And there were times when I'm sure that the teacher was right to the verge of tears. You know, but it's just, I can't. You know, picture it any more than that, but it, it's so firm in my mind. It was a disciplined situation, I'm sure. Do you remember that in this very school, this was when Stella Edwards was the teacher, but they had a man here as a deputy sheriff. He got up. No. <laughs> he has to be here every day. Martha Connell can tell you all about it. She was teaching. after we were gone. I do remember um, down in the big kids' room that <laughs> Stella did at times. And she, I, I thought she was very firm and people didn't mess with her very much. But some of those big guys were kind of a handful. Yeah, well, they, and she'd try to straighten them out verbally and it didn't work. And then she'd kind of grab them and shake them. I remember, you know, kind of grabbing their hair. And, what I remember about that is those were big kids, and she was mad at them. Yeah. But there was never any any concern as we kind of sat there that any of those boys would ever take her back or uh, ever, you know, yeah. do anything but try to kind of get out of the situation. The man that was deputized with the sheriff was Bob Thomas, and he had to be there every day, and he thought it. because those kids. Those big boys. And there was a man, I can't remember his name, there was a man that got here and he did awful things. Yeah, it was like a lot of air out of his fire. It was that big. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Yeah. It was yeah. thrown out the window this weather. <laughs> 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 it was thrown out the window. Sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. 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 Oh, 
<laughs> Ellis, do you have any stories to regale us with? No, I'm afraid I've run dry. Oh. <laughs> I, I can't believe that. <laughs> She started the fire, so she was very concerned that she had to go in case some of those children showed up for mm -hmm. a lot of schoolhouse with no fire. Those are things for good cause. I would just add one thing. I remember um, asking Oral Lunell. He is, what, 94 or so. I don't think he's quite as old as Howard, but getting up there. Uh, I asked him about his days going to school in the Gore, and I asked him, he lived right next door practically, I asked how far people had to walk. And he said, well, the Yahoden children walked from the Yahoden Road, which is, of course, at the end of Bell Hill Road. That was three miles. I said, I bet they didn't come to school very much. He said, they came every day. <laughs> I was curious as to when uh, our <coughs> forebear started going to high school in Oxford. We haven't really nailed that down because all of uh, all of my aunts and uncles and father were going to Oxford uh, from 1910 on. Does anybody have any grandparents that, that, that were actually in the 9th, 10th, 11th, or 12th grade? In a, in a one-room schoolhouse, grandparents, or great grandparents, and you know what? Because at least in 1910, they were going to Oxford High School. Or somewhere else. Or maybe somewhere else. Oh, I guess not. <coughs> Since Otisville did not have its own high school, it paid the tuition to whatever high school the parents sent the child. Uh, now, when that stopped, I don't know. My father, who was born in 1907, went to Oxford High School, for example. Uh, when my sister and I graduated from eighth grade here. We both were enrolled in Freiburg Academy simply because that's where my mother went to high school. She was born and brought up in Freiburg, and of course we had to go to Freiburg Academy. Well, my sister stood it for three years and then refused. Uh, but anyway, uh, I started at Freiburg Academy, then I went three and a half years and graduated from Norway High School, bypassing Oxford. Norway was the largest school. Yes? Well, some of the people in this town went to Bridgeton Academy because some of my ancestors were right there. Yes. Our grandmother Paula went to Bridgeton Academy when she graduated in 1893. So, yeah. so they would have been leaving here. Do you think that the town came for tuition? I don't know. I just know she went. I know she didn't go. Yeah. She wasn't in high school here. She was in Bridgeton Academy. I drove right by. I was in high school and went to McGinn's Club. Now, was there a particular reason for that? Do I have to tell it? No. <laughs> I'll tell it anyway. <laughs> I had a cousin who went to Bowdoin College. And the year that I graduated from the eighth grade, uh, that cousin was at my house. And where is Ellis going to go to high school? Well, I suppose he's going to talk. 
He said, if you let Ellis go to Oxford High School, because I know that guy, he went to both the same time as I do. I'll kick you so hard, you won't know what happened to you. And John Potter happened to be principal of Mechanic Falls High School. So it was decided that I went to Mechanic Falls High School. <laughs> Anyone else want to give us any humor, tidbits of information? Sarah? Yes? I haven't anything to add, but I have a question. Why is it called the door? Oh. You, you missed that part. We, we have to yeah. we have, you, we you missed have. that program. <laughs> oh, dear. We have a lot of that again. Do, do you know what a gore in stretch making is? It's an extra piece of cloth, right? Okay. When they were parceling out some of the territory, they wound up with this extra piece of, of land. Okay? And they hooked it on to Otisville. That's a goal. <laughs> and it's a strip, sort of a wedge-shaped strip, as I recall. Uh, it's usually triangular. Yeah. But it is not in the case of Otisville. Rectangular, yeah. which is between here and Oxford. It sort of starts down in Richville, maybe, and goes up through. Oh, wait. To the Shore of Thompson Lake. To the Shore of Thompson Lake. This was part of the board at the time, I believe. Right here? Yeah. With part of the board? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> if you uh, uh, come across a map, of Otisville where the lot numbers are, are uh, penciled in on it, okay, you'll see a different kind of numbering along through there on the east eastern part of the town map. That's the goal. Other questions? I just have to tell you a story that doesn't belong in Otisville, but it illustrates a discipline problem. And this is a story my grandfather told me in his one-room schoolhouse. He had a way of acting up whenever he thought he could get away with it. And this particular day, the teacher caught him in uh, whatever it was he was doing. He never admitted what it was. But she brought him up in the front of the room. Now this is a wooden floor, nails, been used for many, many years, so each nail took up just a little bit, was nice and bright and shiny. And she said, now John, I want you to bend over and touch that first nail, straighten up and bend over and touch the next nail and go right across the front of this school and don't miss a nail. And she took her ruler that she had in her hand, and she went bang in her hand. He, he ducked a little bit. Well, he did as he was told, and every once in a while, she would wait till he was bent over fully, and she'd slap her hand with that ruler, and he would jump, and the whole class would laugh at him, and she had never had a discipline problem with it again. <laughs> I can remember the teacher, this was when I was going over to, to uh, school in first corner. I'd been in the sixth, seventh, or eighth grade. One of the big kids, huh? Uh, yes. Uh, I was probably in the sixth or seventh grade, okay? I can remember the teacher becoming so provoked at one of the fifth grade girls that she spanked the girl right in front of the whole class. Took her right over her knee. Put her chair right there, sat down. You come here. Turned her turtle and right over her knee and spanked her good. Didn't have any trouble with it. 
least the rest of that day. <laughs> <laughs> it made quite an impression. <laughs> Other questions? Comments? Thank you all for coming. I hope you come and join us in November to hear about the snow and, and ice and how we take care of snow and ice. I assume this would have some comment about snow rock. Okay? Thank you all for coming.